involved in international work for peace as a philosopher since the early 80s. I was elected coordinator of international philosophers for peace. And I've been involved with thinking through alternatives to violence. And so what I'm saying is based on about 35 years study, part of which was done at the University of London here, when I was asked to set up an institute of peace studies. Um, and that is now an autonomous institute based in a castle in Scotland. I've come down from there to join you today. Um, the first thing I want to say is that my talk is really about thinking through a, a reform of the way we conceptualise international violence in this country. I'm, I'm a dual Canadian British citizen, so I'm speaking you know, loosely um, from that international perspective. The way we think of violence and war in our country is well, we can't really do much about it. Um, should we intervene, should we bomb them? Would that help? Should we intervene militarily? If we can't do that, maybe we should do sanctions. And if we can't do that, well, we just sit and watch. You know, I'm saying there's a totally different way to conceptualize our responsibilities, and I'm addressing the British people, you know, the West generally, Canada, etc. I think we should begin to talk about and articulate what I call peace policy. This country is very good at doing foreign policy, defence policy and security policy. And we have think tanks, we have Chatham House, we have incredible intellectual brain power going into thinking through our foreign policy, Haig and Co, you know, and the whole succession of British Prime Ministers. We, we don't have anyone thinking through or articulating a peace policy. What would it look like? That's what I'm going to share with you today in the limited time I've got. Um, the first thing I want to say is peace policy, it would generally conform to what um, VJ has headlined this conference is looking at, which is a soft power, right? As opposed to military intervention, which is defined as hard power or sanctions. But I want to reclaim that term, soft power, slightly. I want to slightly change that and say that, because soft power always sounds a bit flabby, you know, it's, it's hippie-ish, it's like not real. Real people talk about military intervention. Well, I'm, I'm going to argue to the contrary that peace policy requires incredible hardness of will, determination and effort and courage. And just as the brain, which is soft, needs the skull around it to protect it, which is hard, so a peace policy is not, you know, a soft option in a pejorative sense. It's a soft option because it requires intellect, requires deep thought, as does any policy worth, worth pursuing. Um, I'd also argue that a peace policy is in Britain's national interest. You see, traditionally, foreign policy is pursued to promote one's national interests, and there's no harm in that. I'm going to argue that peace policy is actually in, in, in not only Britain's national interest, it's also going to be in Syria's interest, it's going to be in uh, the European Union's interest, it's going to be in Canada's interest, and so on and so on. Um, ever since the Union of Crowns in 1603, when Scotland, where I'm based, joined with England and Wales, our King James adopted a peace policy in relation to Europe. He said Britain's national interest is served by preventing Catholics and Protestants killing each other. He'd been baptised as a Catholic but was raised by Protestants. And he deliberately married one of his sons to a Catholic and one, to a Pro and one of his daughters to a Protestant. He was trying to sit on the fence and say Europe stop killing each other. And that traditionally is what Britain has tried to do at its best. And I would say that we should be continuing in that tradition of, of you know, a hard-nosed peace policy. The European Union also, I've been in touch with Baroness Ashton ever since she was appointed, trying to get her and the European Union to create a European Union mediation service as a pragmatic, bureaucratically funded um, agency within the European Union. And some of that correspondence eventually trickled through. And from the initial rebuffs I got, I then started getting very sweet letters saying, God, this is brilliant. We, we're really trying to do this. And then they got the Nobel Peace Prize. And it's as if they've been talking to the right people. But what I want to do is actually ensure they actually set up a European Union mediation service, which would, which would be offering, in cases of civil war, on the borders of European Union countries, which would include Ukraine, and also the Mediterranean region. Actual, neutral, totally professional mediation staffed by trained experts. 
who are not appointed by European Union governments. They'd be like civil servants in independent posts, therefore not promoting the, the foreign policy of whatever the European Union present governments are saying. I'd say it would be embedded in the European Union constitution that's in the interest of the European Union to see peace in our neighboring region. Okay. Um, and similarly for the United Nations, it's a peace policy. Again, there are no think tanks in the entire United Nations archipelago of institutions. I've spoken twice at UN headquarters in New York. You know, they haven't thought of we actually need a peace policy. You can't just sort of... I mean, the European Union is always running from one emergency to another. And it's never joined up the pieces. And it's never thought through what would a peace policy look like. Okay, so in relation to Syria, let me be concrete, and I've been in negotiations with the Foreign Office about this, is I suggest that a UK peace policy in relation to Syria would be immediately to offer totally neutral and expert mediation between the parties. We've heard today how the, how, what a complex mosaic Syria is. I mean, my nephew works for Al Jazeera, he went and made programs about Syria before all this fighting started. It was always a patchwork, a mosaic of, of people living in harmony reasonably. Um, that is its strength and so a neutral mediation that would draw on all parties which could have, it could be a unilateral peace initiative of the British government, right? We, we can actually take that step. But we can invite European Union and UN colleagues and Commonwealth colleagues to be involved. Practically on the ground in Syria, what would, what would, what would happen? I'm, as a philosopher, I'm biased. I believe that intellectuals have a role to play in peace building. And I believe that the intelligentsia of Syria are sick of this war. And I believe the Syrians in exile are sick of this war. You know, anyone with a conscience is sick of this war. British intellectuals are sick of it. So I'm saying engage with the intelligentsia in the West, but also particularly in Syria and the Middle East. It's not in anybody's interest to allow this horror to continue. We need to involve academics in Syria. There's some brilliant thinkers there. There's some great universities. We, we need to involve the scientific community of Syria. Um, and we need to get all the communities, the Shia, the different groups of Shias, the Alawis, the Sunnis, even the different jihadist groups, they all have their thinking people. They all have some kind of intelligentsia behind them, supporting them. You know, these, these are ancient traditions. The Alawites go back to, you know, very interesting lineages within the Shia tradition. Um, and we, we should be engaging with their thinking power. And the same with the Sunnis. I mean, if you know anything about Syrian history, you know that's where Muhammad himself as a, as a young man went on um, various um, you know, convoys, and one of the first times he was recognized as a spiritual leader was by a Christian monk in Syria. It's an incredibly important place for Islam itself. And one of the greatest um, saints of Sufism, Ibn Arabi, is buried in Damascus. The Sufi tradition is, again, sick of this war, and they should be engaged in the peacemaking process. So, um, let's therefore come up with a peace policy for Syria in this mediation, what I'm proposing, that would have to cover all the outstanding issues, which I would recommend that, that Syria needs to set up a Truth and Reconciliation Commission. There's so much pain, there's so much horror being committed on all sides. Who's thrown chemical weapons around, you know, who's got them? All that stuff, it needs a Truth and Reconciliation Commission that's happened in South Africa. That should be funded through you know, uh, neutral um, sources. There would have to be disarmament on all sides. There's too many guns and weapons floating around that poor country. Um, you know, we saw the beginning of that with the chemical weapons disarmament, but more needs to be done. There would have to be some kind of local security um, arrangements for the local townships and areas and, and, and cities. They'd have to appoint their own sort of security guard system because nobody trusts anybody. There'd have to be a system for getting aid in. We heard from the speaker earlier about this log jam of aid and medicine that's being blocked. You know, that needs to go in as part of this peace deal. I'm, I'm talking about thinking through what a peace policy would actually look like, right? And finally, there'd have to be an election timetable. 
you know, democracy is, as Winston Churchill said, the least worst of all systems. In Britain, we had a civil war in the 17th century. We killed each other, we burned each other's houses, and we slaughtered each other. And when Cromwellian troops found royalists on the battlefield, they slipped their noses off because they thought they were all magicians. The Battle of Naseby. You know, they were fighting an occult war. War's a very nasty thing. But we then invented, you know, parliamentary democracy with a sort of token monarch. Constitutional democracy is a possibility, and Syria's going to have to invent, reinvent that. And then you have elections, and if people want to vote for Assad, you know, that's legitimate. But the last election wasn't legitimate because he was the only candidate. Um, my suggestion, you see, that what I'm talking about is actually a sea change and a revolution in Britain's policy. Um, and I'm saying partly peace has to sell itself. It's a media thing. It has, to, it has to become as exciting, more exciting than war. We all watch on the telly, you know, planes taking off from aircraft carriers. It's all very attractive and exciting. We need something as exciting. So I'm suggesting, why doesn't the UK Navy make a battleship available, right, a peace ship, for mediation purposes? Go and park it in the Mediterranean, right? and invite the Syrian leaders to come on board. So it's neutral international territory, right? It's equipped, it's got cinemas to show them the horrors of war, it's got all the conference facilities, you know. And they're not allowed off the ship till they agree a peace deal that they then take back to Syria. The British Navy used to, used to kind of police the world for about 200 years. I'm suggesting it could earn its keep because we're not quite sure what to do with it now. I've got Britain's nuclear submarines off, off the loch where my castle is. You know, a peace submarine would be quite a nice thing to do with it. It would be all their work. <laughs> okay, um, so the UN Security Council and the General Assembly could be invited to support this, this idea of a peace policy specifically in relation to Syria and could send experts to attend that mediation. The mediation itself should be carried out not by government officials, not by bureaucrats, but by independently appointed academic experts in mediation. You know, there are such people. There are, there are people in, in each European country, in Britain. You know, we have the expertise to solve these problems now, if we were only given the chance. And the government bureaucrats who block and monopolize, you know, and don't even think through peace, and their only solution is to throw bombs at stuff, or sanctions, um, you know, have to essentially get out of the way. Um, because peace policy is really about us, and it's the people's right to, to bring peace in different countries around the world. So um, I think, as I've said before, the Syrian, Syrian intellectuals would then be involved in taking that package, if it was agreed by, by mediators and by the different representatives. They'd have to take that back to the Syrian people and say, look, this is the deal. This is what we've worked out. And somebody said earlier on this platform, peace will only come to Syria with a miracle. Well, I'm providing that miracle solution. Okay, this, this, I'm talking miracles. Because the Shia and the Sunni and the Alawi and the Christian and different factions and the secularists and so on, if they sat down together and said, we've got a formula, that would be a miracle. Well, I think I, I, I know that there is a formula. It is possible. I, you know, I did a doctoral thesis explaining for the University of London, how transpersonal psychology provides a framework for the resolution of intellectual, and ideological, and religious conflicts. Um, so I think that um, all parties in this country should support this. This isn't a thing from Labour or Conservative or Lib Dem or Green. This is something that the whole British people, we could get behind this. And, you know, as John Dunn said, if, if one part of the world is bleeding, it affects me. No man is an island. He was dean here at St. Paul's, not far from where we're standing. Um, why is a peace policy good? Why is it something we should adopt? Well, in, it's purely in foreign policy terms, it actually ticks all the boxes of what foreign policy is supposed to be doing anyway. It removes our enemies and turns them into friends. It would create a world of amity instead of hatred. And that's good for business, it's good for cultural ties, it's good for what we call loosely civilization. You know. What's ha Syria was one of the cradles of civilization. It's in, it's in that you know, fertile crescent area. Um, it's, it's where some of the earliest towns on the history of the planet were. And to me, it's, a, it's, 
it would be good for civilization to see it restored back to peace. Peace policy is good for defense policy because the purpose of defense, as I once, you know, I've, I've talked to, you know, top generals and military thinkers and so on, they agree with me. Actually, the whole purpose of defense is to create peace. They don't like wars. They only fight wars to create the peace. So what I'm saying is create the peace first without having to fight the wars. It's much cheaper. The planet and Britain could bring down our spending on armaments, which is vast. It's, it's trillions of dollars a year, right? So, so it's actually very good for defense policy to develop a peace policy. It's even good for our intelligence policy. The world spends a fortune, every country spying on every other country. <coughs> and as we've seen from Snowden and the other leaks, you know, this is a big business. But they're not actually creating a world of harmony and of, of real, what I would call, wisdom. They're creating a world of fear and paranoia and conspiracies. Whereas true intelligence, as I argued at the beginning, is, is the tough bit that surrounds the brain, um, would be investing in peace. Finding it's good for security policy, because a peace policy creates the conditions of authentic security for people, which we don't have in Syria at the moment. You can't just walk out and go and have a coffee in, in Damascus, and you don't know if you're going to get blown up, or Aleppo, or, or Homs, or wherever. So it would be creating a security that's based on love instead of fear and on friendship and mutual respect, not based on violence and threats. So my conclusion, <clears throat> a few philosophical footnotes, okay. A peace policy it makes good moral sense because it engages people in the project of becoming more virtuous. And since Socrates, we've all been taught that that knowledge comes from virtue. You know, it also fosters feelings of human solidarity. When we, I mean, it, it's not, I'm not waving a magic wand, we're not gonna get rid of all conflicts. People can still fall out and disagree, and I can still be a Shia, and you can still be a Sunni, and I'll be a Christian. But we can engage in a level of disagreement that has a certain civilized tone to it. And, and just as they did in ancient Athens, you know, if you read Plato, they didn't all agree. They were always arguing about what virtue is, but at least they were asking the right questions. Finally, it encourages lysis, which is the Greek term for resolution. And it's the origin of the word analysis or psychoanalysis. If you achieve lysis, you achieve what the Greeks called their equivalent word to enlightenment, which means to dissolve the problem. Problems are caused by knots. Misunderstanding, miscommunication, ignorance. If you achieve lysis, you get set free from that. And that is the essential project that we should be engaged in as human beings. I didn't come onto this planet, you know, I don't think any of us wanted to come and live in a world like we see on the television, the horrors of, of civil wars like Syria. I, I think it's a beautiful planet. And, and I want to help encourage, as a philosopher, my fellow citizens to work towards a place of enlightenment rather than fear and hatred. And finally, it would be a world of greater happiness. Now, philosophers, we, we love promoting happiness. There's now a huge number of publications. Even the government set up a sort of index on well-being. They've, they've done research. They realize that government should be promoting happiness. Um, Anthony Selden, who, who was the headmaster of Brighton College, has written books about happiness. Of course we all want happiness. Well, we want happiness for the people of Syria as well. So we have a moral responsibility to promote a peace policy in this country because it will lead to greater happiness both in this country and abroad. And finally, it makes metaphysical sense. Philosophers love metaphysics because to me it's a metaphysical puzzle we're facing in Syria. We have Shias and Sunnis and Jews and Christians and Muslims and, and different varieties and brands. Now, from a metaphysical point of view, these are reconcilable. It would encourage a greater religiosity. If you, if, you, if you find the peace witness within your religion, and you promote that and you live for that, so you become a peace-loving Shia, or a peace-loving Alawite, or a peace-loving Sunni, you know, all the greatest thinkers, I've studied Islam in great detail, I've done a commentary on the Quran, line by line, which is an audio book, 200 recording hours. If you go into it in enormous detail, you see that the whole point of Islam was to promote peace. But a lot of people have forgotten that. Now, within the Sunni and the Shia tradition, 
Some people in every generation have remembered that. You know, the saints, the sages, the philosophers. And so metaphysically, it makes perfect sense. It is achievable. The idea that Sunnis and Shias have to be at loggerheads is simply based on, on thinking that is, is, is non-metaphysical, non-holistic. They're two aspects of one coin, okay, and, and they belong together. It goes back to quarrels between Aisha and Ali, which are reconcilable spiritually. And there have been very great thinkers on, on all sides. <clears throat> um, so finally, I just want to say that I was with Vijay recently in India, and we were with some Jains and Hindus and other religious thinkers talking about the metaphysics of peacemaking. And I, I was asked to edit this thing called the Jaipur Declaration, which is a kind of blueprint underlying some of what I've been saying today. Time doesn't allow me to really do it justice, but you know, the details are in our Jaipur Declaration. Um, and I'm also running the Centre for Peace Policy Research up in Scotland in this castle. Anyone wants to come up here as a student or scholar, you can come on retreat. We have a huge library there. And we're doing some really in-depth thinking, reconciling the different religious traditions. Uh, and, you know, it is absolutely possible. These wars need not be happening. And the sooner we get our governments to realise that and to actually start talking about a peace policy, please contact me if you hear any politician anywhere on the planet saying, we need to think through a peace policy, because then I'll know they've heard me. Okay, thank you.